done so much I can't remember all that you have done. Oh, for God's sake, don't to make some noise. Mic is on or not? We'd like to welcome you to this evening's session of Von Tunglen Symposium. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kurt Wolf, who was born in Darmstadt, Germany. He was naturalized in this country in 1945, having left Germany in 1933. He attended the U University of Frankfurt with particularly with Karl Mannheim, and at Munich and Florence. He has taught in this country at Southern Methodist, Ohio State, and is currently at Brandeis University. He'd been visiting professor all the way from the New School for Social Research to the Frankfurt Institute and the Social Research Institute in Oslo, and in Paris and New York, just a number of countries we could mention. He has been chairman of the International Committee on Research of the Sociology of Knowledge. He's on the advisory board of practice at Zagreb until it was forcibly closed. He's been on the advisory board for many years of sociological abstracts. With this kind of background, you would anticipate he has presented many, many papers at national and international meetings. Since he is native German, I will not try to pronounce some of the books that he has translated, except to tell you that he's written 11 books in all, besides many, many papers. I was told I should have a good joke tonight, but I forgot to bring my grade book. <laughs> so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Wolf, and it was my privilege to study under for a while. I can't say you know, he tell many jokes or human interest stories, but I can promise you one thing, he will make you think. And it'll be a mind-stretching experience. We're very happy to hear Dr. Wolf. Thank you very much, Floyd. That's quite premature. You don't know what you're clapping for. I mean, to think is not, is not pleasant, which Professor Dean just threatened you with. So my topic is surrender and catch. What I mean by it, what I, how I came to entertain the notions, what their possible significance are, is. Well, I start out perhaps saying how I hit upon the notion. That was in 1944, when I was in a small place in New Mexico, fairly isolated, largely Spanish-speaking community, which I call Loma, and to which I was sent with the understanding that I would try to find out a way, or whether there was a way, in which one could test culture patterns. It was a time when there was much discussion of Ruth Benedict's quite famous book called Patterns of Culture. And most people said it was a very impressive book, but also a very impressionistic book. One didn't know how she got the patterns or whether one should believe her. How could one test that? I had been in that place before <coughs> and had made a very conventional and profoundly boring House to House canvas, which gave a lot of information, such as how far the privy was from the ditch, how many children there were in the house, outside the house, and under the house, in the graveyard, and the like. So I had a lot of information that I didn't know what to do with, except make tables of it. Oodles of them, boring to tears. But. As soon as I got there, the second time, I suddenly didn't know at all why I should study culture patterns. 
I was so impressed by the landscape, by the people, by the smells of the sagebrush, that I found it perfectly arbitrary and uncalled for to study culture patterns or anything else that was imported and hence imposed from the outside, from, say, textbooks or teachers or anyway, some other occasion than the one I found myself in. So instead, what I found was tremendous interest in whatever came to my attention, a frank, frantic recording of field notes, which I had to interrupt all the time because I couldn't catch up with it fast enough, I found everything, in quotes, pertinent, even though I didn't know how, in what way, in what sense. So after a while, I found it necessary to bring some structure to that ever-increasing mountain of TypeScript, and I tried to see what that structure would be. I wanted the structure to grow out of the situation rather than being imported. Now, I had two so-called severest critics at the University of Chicago, to whom I sent, that is, regularly batches of field notes for their response. And the response was quite negative to what I was doing. I was told that if I, the writer wrote, go into the field, I go with a hypothesis, which tells me what to look for and what not to look for, what is relevant and what's not relevant. I found it outrageous. How should I know what was relevant getting into the field without having been there? It was the experience which was supposed to tell me what was relevant and what not. So I struggled along stubbornly without knowing, I repeat, what what I was recording was good for except it was fascinating. Now, a few years later, I taught a course on the small community at the New School in New York, which was really a report on my experience in Loma. And what I then suddenly felt had happened was that I had surrendered to that place, hence the word. Now, by surrender, I mean the maximally possible immediate contact with whatever the occasion. In this case, it was Loma. It could be any occasion. It could be a person. It could be a book. It could be a landscape could be a memory, could be a mood. And I developed some more formal description of that, I don't know what to call it, state or experience, because a distinction makes no sense. It is an undifferentiated experience, where that is ordinarily quite plausible distinctions become irrelevant, make no sense, are in fact ludicrous. So that's one of its characteristics. That received notions, such as, for example, the distinction I just mentioned between state and experience, are suspended. Not denied, nor affirmed, but held in abeyance. That's one characteristic. Another I mentioned also, namely the feeling that everything is pertinent, the pertinence of everything. Another is, or another way of talking about it is to say that it is a maximum identification with the occasion or the topic or the study or the object or whatever. And then there's another, and that is the risk of being hurt. There's a whole gamut of hurts which one can incur. One of the more palpable and indeed vulgar ones is a hurt to one's reputation. 
that is, that if you claim to be or are a sociologist or are a member of a sociology department and publish stuff on surrender, you're considered crazy. It does not add to your capacity for promotion or indeed for getting published. I mean, that's only one kind of hurt. This is particularly painful for untenured people. However, they should nevertheless, if I may make an aside remark, I suppose there are some here, do what they think they ought to do rather than what the powers that be, because otherwise they get ever more corrupt, both themselves and the powers that be. So I make from time to time some nasty remarks, all right? Uh, now, what, they are, what all these features have in common of surrender, I think, is expressed by the identification of surrender with cognitive love. Love for the purpose of understanding, of knowing better than without it, of knowing more surely than without it. And hence, the particular importance of the suspension of received notions, which, that is, would falsify or might falsify your glance at what you are looking at. Because they are not coming out of the situation in which you are. At the same time, and here I mention a much more serious hurt, a much more serious risk, at the same time, we mustn't forget, of course, that we consist of our received notions, which is another way of saying that we are cultured beings. We are not biological organisms and could not possibly survive the biology of man being such as to make that impossible. We have to learn. We have to get enculturated or socialized. Uh, but, but it happens that our culture, by which I mean Western culture, is one which invites us to raise questions about what we have learned, to be critical. So it's quite compatible with the Western tradition to suspend our received notions. Another consequence of that view is that we have to have some before we can suspend them, which means the more we learn, the more we know, the more candidates there are for doubt, the better. And one implication of that is, I think, that a small child cannot surrender because it has to learn. This is, of course, unpleasant to hear of those, to those who think the child does nothing but surrender once the term is in the air. You see how playful, how graceful, and the rest of it. Well, that's a way of learning and a way of not being corrupt yet. But that's not the same as surrender. Now, I was worried about that word, which nevertheless stuck with me, because it has so passive a ring. It sounds like capitulation. The enemy surrendered. And I tried all kinds of other words, none of which struck me as proper. And I finally discovered why I liked that one, or why it didn't let me go. And that is its polemical nature. It polemicizes against the Western tradition, which is the opposite of it, namely mastery, control, manipulation, historically speaking, first of nature, then of fellow men. We have uh, recently come more close to realizing the consequences of that as far as nature goes. That is to say, we are running out of all the things we have exploited. So we have learned that it is important to husband them, to work with nature rather than exploiting it, which we have done for hundreds of years. We have, I don't think, quite as clearly learned yet how damaging it is to exploit people. 
although we have made some headway, thanks to the exploited who have rebelled. And we hear a lot about human rights, much of which is pious, but perhaps better than not to hear it at all. Surrender advocates the opposite. It advocates taking both non-animate and animate things, including men, human beings, seriously, respectfully, trying to understand them. There was early a synonym, I mean I have long used also a synonym of surrender, which has had a similar disturbing effect on me as far as the sound of it goes, namely total experience, which naturally smacked of totalitarianism. But after a while I found that that too was a polemical term, by which I mean that the occasion on which people in recent years have experienced unusual situations in which the ordinary received notions by which they ordinarily navigate didn't avail, where what is known in certain circles in respect to certain literature, extreme situations, namely in concentration camps or in bombed cities or the like. In other words, negative situations. And the term total experience may serve to remind us that it's not all negative. We can have extreme situations also in a positive sense. Now by an extreme situation in this more general meaning, I mean simply an inordinate, an extraordinary, an unusual, a non-routine situation. One in which precisely received notions won't suffice as they didn't, in my experience with Loma, which for that reason you can call an extreme situation. I could not, I did not want to, I found it totally inappropriate to study culture patterns or whatever else might have been the agreement. Now, The outcome of surrender, the knowledge which stood the test, or what, whatever the outcome of it is, which doesn't have to be knowledge in the ordinary sense, can be a decision, can be a sudden insight, can be a realization, or it can be a product. The outcome, or the yield, or the result of surrender, I call the catch. The word catch has an interesting etymology. It is related to capture, that which you capture. It is related to concept, to that which you conceive. And as you all know, conceive as well as conception has two meanings. To give birth to a human being, or to become pregnant in the case of conceive, and to give birth to a new idea, to a conception. And I like that. Hence the word catch. And indeed, I did a short book on it in German, and I translated catch as, which was a very nasty poem against Hegel, Begriff, concept, greifen, grasp. Now, I'll tell you something about my efforts, or one of them, to talk about surrender with students. I did it altogether five times, I mean five years, no, four years and one semester. And the four times, the four years, were senior tutorials at Brandeis. The one semester was a graduate seminar handled quite differently at York University in Toronto. Uh, 
And the first time came about as follows. This was in 61-62. There was a senior tutorial for majors in sociology, which they had originally, or rather their predecessors, asked for. Namely, it was to be a class or a group, a seminar, in which whatever their different interests within sociology had developed to be, they would be once more together and talk about common problems of sociology. And various formats were attempted by my colleagues, none of which f was felt to be successful. And so I said, OK, I'll take it. And I was very interested then in this notion and developing it, had not yet published anything on it, but had at a draft of my first paper, which was the topic of which was rather accidentally on the relation between surrender and religion. And the reason I wrote on that was simply that I was invited to present a paper on the topic at the meeting of the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. So, but I started out this tutorial without using the word surrender. I avoided it very purposely in order not to have it become a gimmick or some other fashionable thing. Instead, I started out explaining what the word tutorial meant, which came from Tuary to take care of. And I asked the students whom I incidentally didn't know, it was about a dozen of them, what it meant for me to take care of them. And of course, they didn't know. It was very hard work to get them to say something, to respond. I hope it's not quite as hard tonight. But we'll see. Oh, dear. All right. So what does it mean for me to take care of you? And uh, I said, well, if the time are ordinary times, I suppose it would mean that I should check whether you are properly prepared in sociology before you are thrown out into the wide world. Some refresher course, maybe, or something of the sort. But uh, we always say these are not ordinary times, these are critical times, these are times of transition, and whatever else we call them. What does it mean then? And again, of course, there was no answer. I said, the only thing I can imagine it means is that I help you to take care of yourselves. Who are you? <coughs> what do you mean, yourselves? Who are you? That, that was the most perplexing question, of course. You know, the crisis of identity, which is so fashionable at that time, was. Is it still in Ames at this time? Never mind. And uh, so I said, I think you are most yourselves when you are most happy or most desperate, when you are in an extraordinary rather than routine situation. Now, I didn't wait for them to ask me what I meant by that. Instead, I read them a few descriptions from literature of such situations, which I will read to you, too. The first is from a novel by C.P. Snow called The Search, and it's a report of a physicist. The physicist is speaking. Then I was carried beyond pleasure. My own triumph and delight and success were there, but they seemed insignificant beside this tranquil ecstasy. It was as though I had looked for a truth outside myself, and finding it had become for a moment part of the truth I thought, as though all the world, the atoms and the stars, were wonderfully clear and close to me, and I to them, so that we were part of a lucidity more tremendous than any mystery. I had never known that such a moment could exist. Since then, I have never quite regained it, but one effect will stay with me as long as I live. Once, when I was young, I used to sneer at the mystics who have described the experience of being at one with God and part of the unity of things. After that afternoon, I did not want to laugh again for though I should have interpreted the experience differently, I thought I knew 
what they meant. And then I talked about that, about that passage you just heard, and did not use, as I will now, the word surrender. I said something like, here's a scientist, as we are told just before that passage, who experiences what he calls tranquil ecstasy, resulting from the fact that an important experiment of his had been confirmed. But really we do not know, and the narrator may not know, whether it was this confirmation that resulted in the tranquil ecstasy that made him understand experiences reported by mystics, might it not instead have led to pleasure, satisfaction, joy, a feeling of triumph, or many other things. The narrator was not seeking surrender, I say I did not use the word, but was surprised, taken, sought, caught by it. It was unexpected. Nor did he expect its result, or the result he reports, the understanding of the mystic. He did not reflect on received notions, on traditions, and elaborate. It was a total experience. There was no manifest connection with his previous life, and what other connections he discovered were unanticipated. There was something new. Then I read a second passage, and I will explain to you after I'm through, there will be two more, why I read them, what I did with it. The second passage is from a very different source, Henry Miller's Tropic of Capricorn. This is Henry Miller now. As I passed the doorman, holding the torn stop in my hand, the lights were dimmed and the curtain went up. I stood a moment slightly dazed by the sudden darkness. As the curtain slowly rose, I had the feeling that throughout the ages, man had always been mysteriously stilled by this brief moment which preludes the spectacle. I could feel the curtain rising in me, in man. I was standing in my own presence, based in a luminous reality. I turned my eyes away from the stage and beheld the marble staircase which I should take to go to my seat in the balcony. I saw a man slowly mounting the steps, his hand laid across the balustrade. The man could have been myself, the old self which had been sleepwalking ever since I was born. My eye didn't take in the entire staircase, just the few steps which the man had climbed or was climbing in the moment that I took it all in. The man never reached the top of the stairs, and his hand was never removed from the marble balustrade. I felt the curtain descended, and for another few moments I was behind the scenes, moving amidst the sets, like the property man suddenly roused from his sleep and not sure whether he is still dreaming or looking at a dream which is being enacted on the stage. I saw only that which was alive. The rest faded out in a penumbra. And it was in order to keep the world alive that I rushed home without waiting to see the performance and sat down to describe the little patch of staircase which is imperishable. And I said something like this in, on this one. Here's another aspect of surrender, I did not say the encounter with indubitable reality that must be held on to, lest the world perish. Again, there was no reason, intelligible to the experiencer, why the vision of that patch of staircase should be at once the occasion in the consummation of surrender, nor any expectation that resulting from it should be the encounter with that compelling reality any more than why in the previous example its result should have been to understand the mystic's experience of being at one with God. And finally, I read them an excerpt from James Agee's Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. The light in this room is of a lamp. Its flame in the glass is of the dry, silent, 
and famished delicateness of the latest lateness of the night and of such ultimate, such holiness of silence and peace that all on earth and within extremest remembrance seems suspended upon it in perfection as upon reflective water. And I feel that if I can by utter quietness succeed in not disturbing this silence, in not so much as touching this plane of water, I can tell you anything within realm of God, whatsoever it may be, that I wish to tell you. And that whatsoever it may be, you will not be able to help but understand it. Now what is new here, I said, or something of the sort, or at least was not explicit in the two previous examples, is the experiencer's certainty of full communication with his fellow men. As long as his experience lasts, he can convey anything, and he who listens cannot help but understand. Man, whoever he may be, when thrown back on what he really is, is thrown back on what he shares with mankind. Now this is a very important point, this last one, which I may come to later if we want to stick it out that long. Anyway, to continue with the tutorial, after I was through, now just figure, you are those people. I said, okay, for next week, because we met once a week, you try your very best to recollect such an instance in your own lives and write about it. And if, no matter how honestly you try, you cannot, then write about that. They rebelled. You would, wouldn't you? Well, we should try that. Never mind. Well, I think about it, how you would react. Of course, you're not a captive audience. Uh, at least I take it the doors are not locked, are they? No. <laughs> I hope not. That's too dangerous, you know, in case of fire. Um, so they rebelled and said, we're not writers. These are writers. That's literature. I said, how do you know? Have you ever tried it? Of course not. So try. Maybe you discover something shortly before graduating. You know, they had missed their boat. They're writers. <laughs> Who knows? Well, uh, That I also said at the first meeting that they should indicate on their papers whether they wanted to read their paper, whether somebody wanted to read his or her paper, or whether they want me to read it without saying who wrote it, or whether they didn't want it read at all. So there were then these papers, and I felt very uneasy because I didn't know what they wrote. And I thought maybe there's going to be some awfully sentimental heart throbbing <laughs> outpour. So I asked rather diffidently whether anybody wanted to read what he or she had written. And then my heart sank further when, when a boy said yes, because then, you know, that was the moment of decision. So I asked rather discouragingly, why? <laughs> why? It's bad enough as it is, no? And he said, because I don't know what it means. And I was delighted. That sounded quite genuine. So I said, by all means, read it. And he did. And he wanted to know what it was that had happened to him. And what had happened to him, not what had happened to him, but the circumstances were as follows. He found himself in Jerusalem, in a Hasidic synagogue, suddenly dancing with other men after a religious service. Now, the Hasidim, a Jewish sect who believe in expressing their veneration of God by joy, by singing, by dancing. And he didn't know what happened to him. For example, one of his, which I didn't say, but which I can say now to you, one of his received notions at this prehistorical time, mind you, was that men do not dance with one another, right? They usually dance with women. They do not dance 
in a house of worship. That still is pretty widely held, I believe, except for certain sects, and not only the Hasidim. And uh, he didn't know what happened to him. So we talked for the whole meeting, which was about three hours, trying to understand. That had an enormous effect, not only on him, but on everybody, because what we did was show, demonstrate, not talk about, but show, and act, respect for another human being, instead of snickering, oh, you're crazy, or to say, oh, that was one of those things, you know, strange, and go on to the next one. It was enormous interest on the part of the others in this experience. And that encouraged them to read their papers, not all of them. And they were not all good in the sense of reflecting such experiences which struck the narrator as important and as puzzling and as somehow changing his life or her life. But we spent several weeks on listening to such stories and talking about them. And then I said, well, what you have been talking about is what I call surrender. In other words, instead of giving them a lecture, as I'm doing now, on surrender, <coughs> I let them discover it and just put a label to it, to what they knew, <coughs> what they had experienced. Then I gave them my own paper, which I had drafted on surrender and religion, and asked them to go to work on it in the light of their own knowledge, which they had just demonstrated, and got excellent suggestions, which I acknowledged. And uh, now the catch, as I say, can be anything. It is as unpredictable as surrender is. For example, for a long time I thought the catch, well, first of all, I thought that I had, this is an autobiographical confession which I cannot quite account for myself, but I use it not in order to make a confession, but in order to illustrate the unpredictability of surrender and catch. For a long time I thought I had surrendered to Loma, and there was a certain degree of it which I described by saying that I had the feeling I must record everything, I must not impose any scheme on the study, <coughs> study of that place. <coughs> to that extent, that was true. But for a long time, I, for a number of versions, in fact, I thought I would write up that study in two parts. The first was uh, a general statement of surrender, and the second was the study of Loma, which was supposed to be an illustration of it. And it took me years to realize that I couldn't do that because I had not there gone with the notion of surrender and acted on it. Instead, what I found, and this is the point I want to make now about the unpredictability of the matter, is that the catch was the notion of surrender rather than what I expected it to be, which was, of course, a community study. And the catch isn't done yet. I'm just catching now. I'm telling you. I'm discovering new things, partly from your reactions, watching your faces, and so on. And I have written a number of papers, which I finally put together in a book. And the second, almost half of it, is a report on the teaching of which I have given you just a glimpse, because as I said, I did it four years and then in that uh, seminar, and I also quote a great deal from student papers and from transcripts and from questions that came up and how we talked about them. I will not say handled them, but talked about them and so on. Now, I came to make a distinction as I was thinking about this notion between surrender, which is what I have talked about so far, and surrender too. Surrender, as you must have gathered, and as I in part said, is not something you can bring about by your own effort. It just happens, or it doesn't. Usually it doesn't, of course. But anyway, you cannot force it. <coughs> 
in that sense, it is very closely related to experiences which have been known ever since there is a historical record and which go by a number of names, many names. For example, conversion, revelation, transformation, metamorphosis. You heard Snow use the word ecstasy and some more. But surrender too can be willed. And what it means is to quite, con quite consciously to engage in such an effort as I have suggested surrender is. That is to say, above all, to suspend received notions as best you can. This is especially pertinent to a study. Not to suppose, that is, that the concepts you have learned either in your general socialization or in the special socialization, which means the study of whatever it is you studied, apply to that topic which you are engaged in studying. You don't know. You have to try out. And the most severe way of trying out is to allow the conceptualization to arise from the situation and then to see whether, in order to do it justice, you can use some of the concepts you have learned and which you have held in abeyance, because you want to see whether they are applicable or not, or in some modified form. So I think, in this sense, it is a much more severe and, you can even say, rigorous test of if you will, theory, than any other I know. That you can will to do. That doesn't take inspiration. That takes time and an extraordinary amount of curiosity and interest. And the implication of what I just said is that I do not advocate at all surrender as the method of studying things, whether that be sociology or literature or whatever. It is only, in my judgment, the optimal or maximal procedure, which, however, is by no means, not only not always, but indeed very rarely called for because most of our studies are motivated by some much more limited curiosity. And the reason that we have these two kinds of studies, I think, has to do with the nature of man. I call man a mixed phenomenon, by which I mean when I say man, incidentally, I mean human beings. I certainly do not exclude women. They are just as mixed as men, in the sense of males, and even children. So man is short for a human being, and I apologize for uh, seeming to have a male bias, which is the fault of the English language. If I were talking in German, I would use the word Mensch, which everybody knows means human being. Okay. So you understand that. By saying that man is a mixed phenomenon, I mean simply that he shares features with many other contents of the cosmos, both inanimate and animate, and others which are uniquely his. For example, he weighs, as the chair does. He displaces space, as material things do. He's hungry, as animals are, and so forth and so on. Among his exclusive things are verbal language, probably symbolization, probably feelings like despair or surrender, and more. And a social science which is sometimes referred to as a study of man, 
which claims to do justice to that subject matter called man, must consequently, by that definition, do justice to both aspects, to what is shared by man and to what is not shared by man. And the kind of social studies I once examined some specimens of in effort to find out to what extent they do justice to both aspects were community studies. One of my papers in Surrender is called Co Surrender and Community Study, and the occasion was my experience, of course, with Loma. But I also examined a number of community studies, most of them by anthropologists rather than sociologists, because I found that most sociological studies are short on one, what is exclusively human. They uh, make study, they, they are studies, let's say, of conflict, of power, of uh, politics, many other such things, which have their equivalents outside man among certain kinds of animals, and so on. And above all, they were assured of not admitting, as it were, that the author was a fellow human being and told about fellow human beings rather than about objects of research. Now, that I found less commonly the case among anthropological studies, and I think there's a perfectly simple explanation for that, namely that a person who, by tradition, is exposed to people who are so palpably different from him or her as the characteristic people studied by anthropologists have been, is more likely to be curious about them rather than manipulatory only in order to add inches to his bibliography. And one of the studies, which was not meant to be, mind you, a community study, which I end up with, is A.G.'s Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. A.G. was, as I'm sure most of you know, sent to the south of this country as a reporter by Fortune magazine to make a study of poor whites and the effect of the Depression, the effects of the Depression in the late 40s. Instead, he fell in love with them as human beings and wrote about that. And it's a very moving book. But my criticism of that book, which, if you haven't read it, I very strongly recommend, because it's so beautiful, I think, was that he romanticized the poor sharecroppers. In other words, he was short on what man shares with others. For example, a need for food, for shelter, for some income with which to buy other things. It's a very romantic book in that sense, very moving, I repeat, but from a point of view which was not, I repeat, his. He meant to be taken as a community study. That was my own choice. It is insufficient but on the opposite score of most sociological studies known to me. So, I did other papers. Surrender and aesthetic experience. I mentioned the one on surrender and religion. I will mention one in particular, namely surrender and rebellion. In order to make quite sure that the passive ring of surrender is removed. I compared it with Camus' analysis of rebellion in his book, The Rebel, where he distinguishes two kinds of rebellion, metaphysical rebellion and historical rebellion. Metaphysical rebellion, for Camus, is a rebellion against the human condition. And that corresponds to surrender. By historical rebellion, he means a rebellion against particular circumstances of wrong or oppression, 
and that corresponds to surrendering to something. You see, in comparison to surrender, and that's another dif difference between it and surrender to, surrender to is less unconditional. Namely, it is conditioned by its occasion. The purpose is to be as penetrating, as comprehending of its topic as possible. But the topic is there. Now, it can, of course, happen, and that merely is an illustration of the unpredictability of surrender, that surrender to changes into surrender. That is, that the topic in the course of this experience disappears, or turns out to be not quite what the person meant, even though he or she thought so. But in that case, we have no longer surrender to, but have surrender to rather as the occasion of surrender. But that has nothing to do with the distinction between the two. Now let me end up with a word on the historical significance, as I see it, of surrender. I said before that it is related, intimately related, to a number of other, to, to, to experiences which have been reported on under a number of other terms. But I think the difference of it is, it, I mean, between it and all of them, that it is historically very conscious of the time in which that notion was developed. It is a time which I think in the history of mankind is entirely unprecedented. We have the nuclear bomb, by, mit by means of which we can do what has never been possible before, simply technically, namely wipe out mankind in a very short time. That's a new situation, an unprecedented situation. There are other unprecedented things. I already mentioned the depletion of natural resources which has such a degree that, according to some people, it raises questions about the possibility of mankind to survive beyond a certain period of time unless unknown inventions are made or resources found. Well, that's quite new. Another thing which is new and related to all of these is the smallness of the globe, by which I mean you can be anywhere within a few hours. Now you see, all of these and many more things are the results of technological developments which have made them possible. But we are not on top of them at all. We are victimized by them and we don't know what to do. One response is another novelty and that is totalitarianism. Because that is not the same as traditional dictatorships which of course are very old. And totalitarianism, too, as a very term implies, would not be possible without technological developments, such as surveillance, for instance, which make it possible for one person to find out what everybody is doing anywhere. I'm sure you're aware that it's not unknown in this country. If you remember Watergate or McCarthy or similar situations, I'm not suggesting that we live in a totalitarian society, which would be perfectly idiotic, because we don't. But I say we also have, of course, a technology. Well, that's new, too. Now, why should, in such an unprecedented situation, precedented, as it were, concepts, be adequate? Why should it not seem plausible that the traditional ways of coming to terms with our lives no longer will do? Because the lives have changed. Now, this historical significance of surrender, I think, is what distinguishes it from all other 
otherwise closely related notions. For example, my late colleague Abraham Maslow, that some of you may know, he was a psychologist, talked about self-actualization and peak experiences. He was very interested in surrender and very encouraging and very helpful to me. But I could not convince him, and, uh, uh, not convince him, but I wasn't interested in convincing him, but I couldn't make it clear to him that his treatment of peak experiences and self-actualization was totally unpolitical. In other words, anybody could use it, and people have used it. If you think of tea groups, and the use management makes of them, in order to secure the status quo. Maslow himself taught businessmen how to actualize themselves. It was very good for the profit. In other words, anybody can use it. Now, that is not possible with surrender, because what it does is invite, I repeat, the questioning of all received notions, all received notions, to the extent that a person can stand it. So on this very uncomfortable note, let me close for questions. And thank you for your attention.